Father created mankind with the ability to speak, and he gave us a single language to share. It's our belief that the language Father originally gave to mankind was Hebrew, and that he created the Hebrew alphabet in advance for us. In its original form, the Hebrew alphabet consisted of pictures that were easy for people to understand. The alphabet includes pictures of an arm, an eye, a mouth, a shepherd's staff, and other items that are as relatable to us today as they were to the men and women who lived before the flood. Today, most scholars learn and teach an understanding of language that is heavily influenced by a society's belief in evolution and disbelief in God. In their understanding, man evolved from primates, and language either derived from a series of primitive grunts or was a byproduct of evolutions in people's brains. Evolution, they say, produced the languages. It's widely taught by biblical and secular scholars alike that the Hebrew language in particular didn't even exist in the time of Abraham. Anyone trying to understand biblical language and writing should be aware that most scholarship on the subject is debased by these frameworks of thought. However, the scriptures teach us that Hebrew was in use even before the flood. As one example, the Spirit of God had Moses record the words that Eve used when she named her sons. She called one son Cain, Cain in Hebrew, because she had acquired a son from God. The name Cain comes from the Hebrew word for acquired, which is kana. She called another son Seth, Sheth in Hebrew, because God had appointed another son for her. The name Sheth comes from the Hebrew word sheath, which means appointed. There's also Noah, who was named for the comfort he would bring. Noah's name in Hebrew is Noach, and his name comes from the Hebrew word Naham, which means to comfort. Cain, Seth, and Noah were all given Hebrew names with Hebrew meanings, and this was before the Tower of Babel, when only one language existed on the earth. It's clear from reading the Bible that Father has books in heaven. He certainly did not wait for mankind to develop an alphabet before he began recording events and placing names into his book of life. Therefore, we know of at least one writing system that he authored, the one he created for his own use. Some believe that for us here on earth, he used a derivative of Egyptian-made hieroglyphs to write his Ten Commandments on the stone tablets. But Egyptian hieroglyphs were used to glorify Egyptian gods. It's doubtful that he used their symbols to write the words, Thou shalt have no gods before me. If anything, we believe it would have been the other way around, and the post-Tower of Babel Egyptians with a memory of Father's original alphabetic characters, used some of his ancient symbols when they created their own writing system. The original Hebrew alphabet consisted of pictographic symbols, and Hebrew words in their original pictographic forms show clear evidence of Father's intelligence and foresight. Here are a few examples. The Hebrew word for walk is a picture of a staff and a hand. The Hebrew word for the sea has a letter in it, which is an easily recognizable symbol for water. And the Hebrew word for weeping has that same water symbol, followed by the symbol for a human eye. The number of examples is beyond coincidence, and each time we study the Bible in Hebrew, we find more and more examples. You don't need to know Hebrew or study the Bible in Hebrew to hear from God or to understand his words. Since creation, he has provided his people with knowledge and understanding using whatever languages they know and speak. We study Hebrew because it's fun to investigate the things his spirit inspired men to write. For centuries, believers have done Hebrew word studies to search out his meanings. For us... Studying the meanings of his words includes looking at the letters that make up those words. What we've found is that the original Hebrew, in many cases, offers a simpler understanding of his words. It's written in the book of Proverbs 
that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. If you take a look at that verse in Hebrew, not only is it more poetic than the English translation, but it appears to hold a biblical basis for those of us who like to do word studies. It reads, Kabod Elohim haster dabar, u kabod melakim hakor dabar. A more literal translation of this verse would be, It is the glory of God to conceal a word, and the glory of kings to examine a word. At the Tower of Babel, it's written that Father looked on man who was of one speech and one set of words, and he mixed up their sounds so they couldn't understand one another, and so they could not act in one accord, because their plans and their ways were not his. But his prophet Zephaniah told us that when his kingdom comes to earth, he will return to his people a chosen and pure speech, and that this language will be restored for the very purpose of man acting in one accord, because in those days we will use our common speech to call on his name and serve him together. That day of a chosen speech that we can all speak is yet to come, but it is coming soon. The restoration of his language is part of the end of days restoration of Israel. We're living at a time when people throughout the world, of every race, language, and nation, are hearing his voice. And his voice is telling them that Israel is their heritage. To identify and regather all twelve tribes of Israel is the great work of the Lord in the end of days, as spoken by the prophets. Today, many from the tribes of Dan and Asher, Naphtali and Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, Judah and Levi, Benjamin, Simeon, Ishakar, Zebulun and Gad are finding themselves being put together bone by bone and muscle by muscle, as the prophet Ezekiel foretold. For us, learning Hebrew is one part of the bigger picture, of discovering the heritage of our fathers. At the end of tribulation, we are promised a kingdom, with Jerusalem as its headquarters, Yeshua on the throne as King of Kings, and the land promised to Abraham portioned out to the tribes of Israel and the believers in Yeshua who sojourn among them. It's written that those sojourners will receive an inheritance as native-born children of Israel in whatever tribe they choose to reside. To those of you who long for his day and his kingdom to come on earth, to those of the nations who call him father, and to those of the 12 tribes of Israel who call him father, shalom, shalom unto Jerusalem.